Hello and welcome to Lagging History on YouTube. This short tutorial is on the Cap Putsch. The Cap Putsch took place in March 1920 and was a right wing attack on the newly established Weimar democracy. We're going to try to work out what caused the Cap Putsch, what happened during it and what were the consequences. So firstly we're going to have a quick briefing on what it actually was itself. Uh, the Putsch was um, an unsuccessful but worrying right-wing attempt by large elements of the Freikorps to march on Berlin and seize power in March 1920. It proved a major challenge to the new Weimar democracy and it severely undermined public support in the new government and its ability to be effective and overcome the numerous challenges it faced. The putsch also showed the government's dangerous over-reliance on right-wing forces to keep order. So let's have a closer look then at what caused the putsch. Um, first we have to understand a key group in this. It's called the Freikorps or Free Corps. You can use either names for any exams. Uh, this was a group of mostly uh, ex-soldiers who were right wing, highly nationalistic and a lot of them had, had come back from the First World War very brutalised. Uh, they were very well organised, very expert in using arms. But they were glued together by their violent hatred of communism. They blamed communists for uh, stabbing Germany in the back, for Germany's defeat in the First World War um, and they were determined to stop communism and destroy any elements of communism within Germany. Very famously the Freikorps had actually been a key part in ending the Spartacus uprising in January 1919. That was a communist attempt to seize power uh, following the end of the First World War. The Freikorps deeply involved, they um, rounded up many of those involved, they uh, killed an, an, a large number of them and they actually killed the leaders of the Spartacist uprising which was uh, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Um, the causes themselves, well by 1920 there was a diminishing uh, dependence on the Freikorps. The Socialist, that's the SPD led coalition government, had less use for the Freikorps. Um, they were regarded as being no better than a necessary evil in 1919. Remember, the Weimar government knew that the Freikorps hated communism, but they also were aware that the Freikorps were not wholly loyal to uh, democracy either and would uh, easily support um, any groups that were um, opposing Weimar. So, uh, the Treaty of Versailles was the next section, and very important it is too. This is perhaps key because the, the Versailles Treaty signed in 1919 stated within it that the army, the German army, is to be reduced to 100,000 men. This was a massive scaling down for a military minded nation like Germany, who was used to being the largest military power uh, in continental Europe. To meet this demand, the Defence Minister Nosk ordered two brigades of the Freikorps, that's up to 12,000 soldiers, to be disbanded. That included elements of uh, the elite uh, Marine Division. Uh, anger at this request gathered momentum and quickly a right wing plan to try to seize power developed. One Freikorps commander, General von Lutwitz, defied the order to disband and he was quickly supported by some army leaders and very importantly by Wolfgang Kapp. Kapp was a right wing nationalist politician and leader of the, the Fatherland Party uh, within Germany. It wanted a dedicated it dedicated itself to a restoration of the Kaiser and a repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. This group were not actually supported by members you'd expect, uh, for example Ludendorff and von Sicht. They weren't supported by these people openly. However, they give the impression to those in the putsch that um, you know, they could take a calculated risk that they would not be attacked uh, by military force uh, during any attempted putsch. So this gave them a bit of confidence that they could try to seize power and potentially they would not be uh, attacked. So this is uh, Wolfgang Kapp, the leader of the Fatherland Party here, the nationalist politician. And this is von Lutwitz, the, uh, the commander who actually said he was not going to disband his regiment. So what were the events of the putsch itself? Well the first thing that happened was the march on Berlin. 12th of March 1920, Cap, Lutwitz and 12,000 troops marched 12 miles from their base to Berlin. When they got there they seized control of the, the large and very important government quarter. This is how Germany is run from the central area within Berlin. So they seized, uh, seized that area and they declared that they were going to establish a military dictatorship, a military autocracy within Germany. Cap was declared the new Chancellor of this provisional 
um, government and von Lutwitz was declared the military commander in the takeover. What was left open to Weimar was what you'd expect. It was the use of the army. The use of the, the, use of the army to actually put down the putsch the same way as the Spartacists to be put down in 1919. So the army went to von Sicht and asked, look, you have to put down this putsch that's happening in Berlin. However, very importantly for the story, von Sicht refused. He actually said, the army does not fire upon the army. This left the Weimar Democrats in absolute crisis. What was left open to them, they had, their uh, armed force was gone. Uh, the people with with uh, the military uh, supplies were in Berlin, and they were the people who had seized government buildings. They needed something else to try to uh, to try to end this putsch. So the only thing open to them was a direct appeal to the people. So they many of the government left Berlin for Dresden, and then on to Stuttgart. And they made a direct appeal to the people uh, to end this pitch. How could they end it? Well, they ended it uh, through a general strike. The Weimar government appealed directly to the people to take part in the strike. Uh, the putsch itself was clearly not popular, even with right-wing sections, because the civil service refused to take part, didn't support it, financial institutions didn't support it, and the army was at best neutral. Some small sections of the army supported them, but uh, it was at best neutral. The left wing, as you'd expect, were completely opposed to this right wing attempt to seize power. Look how well that was that strike was actually supported as well. Up to twelve million German workers responded to the strike. It had paralyzed Berlin, shut down transport links, shut down supplies of gas, electric. It was very obvious to those taking part in the putsch that they were not supported, and after four days the putsch ended. This seemed to be like obviously very ineffective, uh, very ineffective pitch. However, it's really important you understand the consequences of this because it has a major impact on Weimar history. Um, firstly, this was very obviously treason. It was an attempt to seize power, uh, an effective attempt to seize power, and you'd expect those to be taken part in this to either be tried and given hefty prison sentences or even executed. Uh, what's clear by this, though, is how little was done. Kapp himself escaped to Sweden. He died of, of cancer there not long afterwards, before he could actually put on try, trial. Um, Ludendorff, Ludendorff was not regarded as playing any part in the putsch. He actually suggested he was out for a walk <laughs> and got away with it. Von Sicht, well, von Sicht was actually promoted. He was promoted not long after the putsch. This is the guy that actually refused for the army to fire upon the army. Uh, this was a sign that, despite the treachery uh, in the face of the putsch, the Weimar government still completely relied on um, generals like von Sicht to actually keep order and keep the left-wing forces uh, at bay. Von Lutwitz left Germany on a false passport given to him by members of the Berlin police. Um, it shows you how uh, right-wing connections are infiltrated a large amount of the um, law and order. Um, he returned in 1924 after an amnesty was announced, and others involved, well, they were tried very leniently by judiciary, which was clearly sympathetic to their cause. You can see this later on with uh, Hitler and the Munich Put as well, too. The judiciary are clearly on the side of those uh, of the right uh, and not the left. Secondly, then, Weimar weakness was clearly exposed. Leighton would suggest that this appeared to be a victory um, for the new Weimar democracy, but Clearly, he also clearly suggests that underlying this here is a sign of weakness, that it's very de clear how dependent the Weimar democracy are on right-wing forces. The army was even allowed to run its own affairs after the putsch. Uh, this lost the Weimar government huge support and was demonstrated very clearly at the next elections. Uh, so pro-Weimar parties went from a huge majority and this was absolutely slashed um, to um, to very, you know, a lot of extreme parties began to um, increase very quickly, and you can see this in this graph here, in this um, sorry table here, where you have the Social Democrats uh, cut down from 38 percent to 21 percent, the Centre Party, a pro Weimar party again, from 20 percent to 8 percent, that's over half, uh, and on the other side of the coin down at the bottom here, you have the uh, Communists, that's a KPD, uh, up from 7.6 percent to 19 percent. Uh, German People's Party, DVP, from 
4.4% to 14%. It's clear that this is a, an election of two sides. You've got the losers, which would be the pro Weimar parties, and you've got the winners, who would be the extreme parties of left and right. And finally, uh, an often untold story about this was what's called the Ruhr Rising. In one area of Germany, the industrial Ruhr, industrial Ruhr area, it's an area where you'd have lots of factories, lots of uh, coal mines, very, very industrialised. Strikes there continued and they actually formed their own Red Ruhr Army. It had up to 50,000 members and this actually went on the offensive. It actually um, seized cities like Dortmund in a bid to get new concessions for workers. Um, ironically, however, President Ebert used uh, the army and some of the Freikorps, Corps, including many of the members who had just taken part in the putsch, to actually come to the Ruhr and put down this um, this rising, this Ruhr rising, uh, on behalf this time of the government. Um, hundreds were actually killed in this. Many were actually executed on the spot. If you were caught with any sort of firearm, you were summarily executed. And um, this was really badly um, thought of by many left-wing parties and led to a really big split, a division within left-wing forces in Germany, which would actually um, not have healed um, and would be you know, highly ineffective whenever it came to then opposing Hitler later on. So this did have a, a, a massive range of consequences on Weimar democracy, uh, which we, we should all be aware of. Well, I hope this helped. Uh, you can discover more on laganhistory.com. Many thanks for listening.